Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, as has been shared, it is a beautiful and wonderful thing to be able to gather here today as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to read His Word, study His Word, hear His Word, pray, and orient our hearts in uh, this uh, equipping station, which is what our church really is. It's an equipping station. It's, a, it's an equipping station for the saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And uh, as, as we have been told, we've been told to gather, and that's why we, we do, that's what we do, what we do today. But uh, there, it is impossible to, to go forward in today without acknowledging uh, that there is a lot, of, a lot of chaos in our world at the moment. And it just doesn't seem like it ever stops. But it certainly there is um, a, lot of, a lot of need for even more prayer. Um, and so we're going to pray some more. Specifically, we're going to remember and pray for our sister uh, Linnea right now, who's just uh, struggling through some, you know, uh, sickness. And we just pray that we're going to pray that she she overcomes that rapidly. Uh, again, Vadim, you may be watching our brother uh, in the Ukraine, who is uh, who held church this morning. I'm going to pray for him. I've got uh, my great aunt Nell. Um, and her husband James, uh, and the rest of their family. Uh, Nell is is uh, is in her last moments, perhaps even as we speak. Um, and we, we're going to pray for for her. I found out this morning, even as I was preparing uh, this morning, that a, a former teammate of mine, a teammate that I had for ten years in rugby, uh, passed away uh, last night. Um, and we're going to pray for James. Um, but obviously, as we think about this, we think of the, the, the attacks on the flesh in terms of health challenges and struggles there. We think of the, the massive amount of death and destruction that we witness in the Ukraine and in war and the horrible, uh, horrible things that are a part of that. Regardless of any politics, those are somebody's children that are dying, somebody's brother that's dying, somebody's mother, wife, child. Those are all people that are, that are dying. Um, I can think of my, my Aunt Nell, who doesn't have much longer uh, today, and then my, my teammate James. And then we obviously can't ignore uh, the, the, what, what feels like an a, a comp- absolutely horrific tragedy um, with the shooting here in Texas, uh, with 19 children lost, two teachers. Um, there's just so much to pray for. So join me in prayer before we get into today's um, lesson. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for the fact that we can gather. We thank you for, I thank you for these brothers and sisters that are here, those that are traveling, um, those that are part of our community, those that know members of our community. Uh, Lord, I ask that uh, the brothers and sisters here uh, are reminded today to fear not, um, to fear not and to continue to feel the, uh, the, your assurance that we are to be salt and light to the world. Um, But most presently, we call on your your name and in your name to heal our sister Linnea uh, from the things that she's got going on today and last night. We ask that just rapidly that she be, that those things be removed from her and that Brittany is given encouragement and strength this morning as she cares for her. In that same vein, we ask um, that your hand be upon all the children, um, specifically Roger, um, and, and helping him with his hearing, um, Perry with her speech, um, Oralee with her healing that she's doing, um, and then just on and on. I mean, all of, all of these children, we ask that your, your hand be upon all of them. Lord, we ask that you be with our brother uh, Vadim in the Ukraine and then with his wife, uh, Yana. Uh, today he was joined by his parents, Peter and Valentine, his father and mother, his nephew Timothy, and a, a young girl that has just now stepped into relationship with them, and her name is Myra. We ask that, you know, in, even in amongst a war zone, we know that you can work and that you're working there. We continue to ask for your prayers there as they have been, um, they've, been they've witnessed destruction coming closer and closer to, their, to where they are. Lord, I ask that you be with uh, Nell and James Davis and Desiree and Max and the rest of their family as they stand with her in these final days and moments uh, as she will soon be face-to-face with you. 
And indeed, that is a joyful thing. Uh, Lord, I ask that you be with the family of James David, his wife Marissa, and his 11-year-old daughter Ashlyn, Ashlyn um, who may have um, questions today and deep sorrow about what this means. And Lord, we ask that you are with the families of the children that were called home uh, and the two teachers that were, that were, uh, were lost um, in here in Texas. But we also, not only them, not only those families, but the police officers that were involved, uh, the families of those lost, and even the families of the, shoot, the family of the shooter. Um, and those believers that are inside of that entire conversation. And perhaps the, we ask that you also be with the non-believers who are faced with this across the country and they don't understand it. And we ask that this be a, a, an event that, that in its tragedy pushes people not to look for solutions made by man, but only the one and only solution that is in you. We ask all these things in your son's name, your son Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, in the year 525 A.D., a 55-year-old Romanian monk known as Dionysius the Humble was searching to solve a problem. He needed to be able to predict future, when the future Easter services were going to happen or when the future sequences of Easter were going to happen, as he was trying to figure out. Um, at the same time, he also wanted to replace an old dating system that was currently used uh, for numbering the years. It was called the Diocletian system. Uh, it was named after a the, kind of the last tyrant that really had put a persecution on the, on the Christians. And so here's this monk at 55 years old kind of searching for this mathematical solution with probably little idea that he was going to change the way we think about time and world history by trying to solve this problem. Uh, it took several hundred years for his new way of categorizing when things happen to catch on, but he's the origin of how we have an, a B.C. and an A.D., right? Things in the B.C., we think of, you know, probably conjures up ideas of, you know, cavemen and Romans and, uh, 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 um, you know, the Spartans and Greece and all of these things, and then we think A.D., well, that's, that's where we are today. Uh, it's commonly thought that B.C. stands for before Christ and A.D. stands for after death. Uh, this is only half correct um, because of the way things were calculated. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't want to really consider the year 1 B.C. to have been before Christ and A.D. after death. Um, A.D. actually stands for the Latin phrase Anoni, uh, Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. And the B.C. and A.D. dating system, though it's not taught in the Bible, is actually, oh, and, it was, and it, was not, it was not taught in the Bible, it's not, actually not fully implemented until several centuries after Jesus' death, but the outcome is what's interesting, is that it is this dating system made the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ the dividing point in world history. It's fitting, therefore, that Jesus, is separate, that Jesus Christ separated the old B.C. from the new uh, and since his birth, we have been living in the year of our Lord. And viewing our era as the year of our Lord is appropriate. Philippians 2, uh, 10 through 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the, and to the, and to the glory of God the Father. So uh, at some level, the fact that we're in 2022 is an acknowledgement of the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, now, of course, uh, there is a movement, and there has been a one to change this to things like BCE, which means before common era, and CE, which means common era, and the change is really one of semantics because while they may change the name, the year stays the same. So you're still saying it's, BC, it's 2022 CE, common era, but sorry, we're still counting from, from what? Still counting from the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's, you know, the irony is there. You still can't get away from it. And you can call it what you want, but the point here is that there was a time before Jesus Christ was physically here on earth in the likeness of sinful flesh, and a time after he had died, risen, and defeated death once and for all. I'd have you consider that you 
we all have a personal BC and AD in our lives. There was a time where we were before Christ, we was before he had arrived in our life, where we had recognized him, and then there's a time since that time. And we are called to live differently in our AD than we did in our BC. And we're going to talk about that today. So let's pray, and we're going to step back into the letter of, uh, of Peter, uh, 1 Peter today. Lord, thank you again for this, this word that you've given us. Thank you for the fact that we have access to it so easily, that we take it for granted that we are able to hold the living word in our hand without someone seeking to take it away, that we can get your word on our phones. We can keep it all the time. We can literally keep this oxygen tank of your spirit next to us at all times. Lord, uh, thank you for giving it to us today. Thank you for inspiring Peter to write this. And thank you for bringing these words inspired and carried along by the Holy Spirit through centuries, all the way from Peter to us today in 2022. Your son, Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to step right back into the chapter 4 of 1 Peter, so you can join me there in the Word. And we're just going to read it, and we're going to get a little bit of a rolling start. So we're in chapter 4, 1 Peter, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh, in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking partings, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they may live in the spirit the way God does. And I'm going to give us one bonus here. Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So last week, and if we get, come back to this letter of Peter, and if you remember, this is the same Peter that walked right alongside Jesus, the same Peter that was called, the same Peter that was rash and impulsive, uh, usually reminding us of us most of the time, saying, oh, let's do something, and then not really thinking before he does things. Um, he's also the same Peter that though he was declared that he would never leave Jesus Christ and I will go to death with you on that same day, he denied him three times and left his best friend alone on the cross. That same Peter that later would be called and said and told, go feed my sheep. The same Peter who, uh, as tradition holds, would one day be crucified upside down after watching his wife be crucified all for the sake of Jesus. That St. Peter, at this point, is writing a letter to these churches scattered across Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, sending them a letter saying, be encouraged. If you were to consider the entire letter of 1 Peter, you could sum it up in, stand firm in suffering. And as we learned last week, that's not the whole story. Last week, Pastor Jonathan said, you know, uh, only, the suffering piece is only one part of the story. The second part of the story would be, stand firm in suffering, triumph is coming. Right? Triumph in suffering is coming. The doorway to that triumph is suffering. And so we come back to that. He says, suffering, Pastor Jonathan says, suffering is not the end of the story. In fact, we are called, not called to avoid suffering in this world through perhaps compromise or isolation. Instead, we are told that our suffering, all suffering, has a purpose. If we're being given suffering, given fiery trials, given these trials that come upon us for a little while, as necessary, as we heard earlier in the book, he says so that, that if, it, if, it is, uh, if necessary, you have, you, will, you have been grieved by various trials, that it is necessary, there's a reason for it, there's a reason we're going through whatever we're going through, is Difficult as that may be for our human intellects to comprehend, I can promise you right now there's 
no comprehension that human intellect could grab onto alone without the guidance of the Holy Spirit for what happened here in Texas and the loss of those children. There's no way to grab onto that if we rely on ourselves. But there is a purpose. For indeed, it was in Christ's greatest suffering that his greatest victory was accomplished. As a result, as we saw last week, he rules all. And as Pastor Jonathan shared, there was a victory lap for his victory, for, to proclaim his victory. For as it was said, the resurrection, for, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. The entire universe is subject to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was his way. As we learn, today's verse says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Well, let's take a, we got to reverse back and go, well, okay. What was Jesus' way of thinking? What was his way? Well, number one, we know he was patient. He was very patient. He was patient from the beginning of time. Uh, he did not repay evil for evil. Those that slandered him, those that mocked him, those that tortured him, those that attacked him, those that hit him in the face, his response was never to hit back. He actually forgave his enemies. He said, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. The point is this, as we've talked about, he was never a victim. Though his apostles at that time may have watched and said, look at what these men are doing to our Lord. He was never a victim. The work on the cross was the most offensive thing that's ever happened. Jesus was always on the offense. In his offensive manner, to take on all sin for all time, once and for all, happened. And through that, he was not a victim, but a victor. And so shall we be in our suffering. Jesus demonstrated that the path to victory is through suffering, and he gives us a weapon for living in our current age, our current AD, our current where we are since we have been called for those that have been. If we revisit this, since therefore, the verse, uh, verse 1, chapter 4, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. That's the operative part of this phrase. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves with what? The same way of thinking. Why? For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in your flesh, no longer for human passions, like you did in your B.C., but for the will of God, as you should be doing in your A.D. Uh, as Christians, once we have been called into him, we spend our whole lives fighting, fighting with and fleeing sin. We're told to put on the armor of God. And this, it's always this posture of battle and warfare, because that is absolutely what it is. It says we do not flood war against flesh and blood, but against spiritual things. Our, it is warfare. Make no mistake. But our view of what death is is a different thing than what the world would say it is. You see, if we're spending our entire life from that moment of being called out, we're moving, like our life is in a place of moving away from what was, closer to him, but never fully, in this fleshly body, fully absolved from sin. Fully un, like, like we're still fighting that to win, till death, till death. It ends. Death ends sin for the believer. You're no longer struggling with it. What a wonderful thought. In fact, we could even think of to say, uh, death is actually the best thing that can happen for a Christian. We see this in the martyrs. They say, you're persecuting me for my faith. You're telling me to renounce Christ. I'm not going to renounce Christ. I know where I'm going. You're actually doing me a favor. You're sending me to be face-to-face -face with my Lord right now, and, I, and you're ending sin for me for all time. So thank you. And we saw over and over again, as we've shared in some of the stories of the martyrs in the past, 
in that moment where perhaps the torturer or the executioner is executing the person who is submitting to this, in that moment, something changes in that executioner. And they, in some cases, put down their sword and got to their knees and were executed right along with the submissive Christian who was mirroring the behavior of Jesus Christ. But that door, that door of death, looks the same for the obedient and it looks the same for the rebellious. The difference is what's on the other side. Death is the doorway for the obedient for, to perpetual glory and the ending of sin in their reality. But for the rebellious, it's a, de- it's a doorway to perpetual torment for all time. So how are we supposed to deal with, like, if we know that, then how, what does this arm ourselves? Well, the, we're told to arm ourselves, which is truly this idea of picking up something. To, to, the word uh, hoplizo is the Greek, hoplizo. It means to arm oneself with weapons. And so it literally is, is back to this idea of put, putting on the full armor of God. You know, let's come back. What, what, what am I supposed to arm myself with? Well, go back to what is Christ's way of thinking? The same way of thinking, knowing that suffering leads to triumph. It's the same thing we're told in James. Count it all joy, my brothers, the various trials that come, right? Every trial has a purpose. I know that in the depths of suffering, especially if it's suffering for his sake, for persecution for him, I know that on the other side of that, there's victory. That same way of thinking should be what? Patient. Not repaying evil for evil forgiving our enemies, never, ever putting on the title of victim, which is simply self-worship. Instead, recognizing I'm a bought and paid for, washed in the blood, slave to Jesus Christ, and as a result, an heir along with him, and a victor. A victor, never a victim. So in your BC life, if you think back about this, and I want to you know, take a moment, right? There was a moment before you knew these things. There was a time in all of our lives, that maybe it was when you were a child, maybe it was when you were an adult, maybe it was last year, maybe it was yesterday, I don't know. Whenever this message reaches, whoever it reaches, there was a time in your life where you were fearful of death and perhaps searching for meaning. And suffering, when you looked at it and experienced it, had no meaning. I can personally think back on this uh, with my mom. At 19, uh, my mom got cancer within a year after going through horrible chemotherapy. Uh, she, she died. And I spent that entire year and all that time thinking that if I did all this stuff, that God would save her. That was my theology. I'd been brought up Catholic, and I had no experience with the word. I had experience with a lot of go-to mass, but not, wasn't pushed to the word. And as a result, that's what I brought to the table into that suffering. When I saw that suffering, I said, when she died, I, my story was, there was no meaning in that. She didn't deserve it. What's the point, God? You didn't hold up your end of the bargain. I'm out. That was my response. I didn't, have, I didn't have the weapon of thinking the way Christ thinks. I didn't even know who he was. I didn't know his voice. I had not heard his voice. I was still in my BC. I was still in my before Christ. I was before called. Did Christ have me in his hand? I would tell you yes. I would tell you yes. But he was working on me. He's a, the shepherd's always had who he's going to have. We experience it as this thing that we go through, but it's always his plan. But now, in your A.D. life, you are armed with the confidence that suffering leads to triumph. And I can see this. I can see that if it was, my, if it was still in my B.C. age and I didn't understand that suffering actually has meaning and purpose and there's triumph on the other side of it, I would probably look at my Aunt Nell right now who's been not responsive for two weeks 
as incredible suffering with no meaning. But I'm, uh, me and our family, we, like, she's going to be face to face with the Lord. That woman has fruit upon fruit upon fruit. Where there's no doubt. She's going to be face to face with the Lord Jesus momentarily. Praise God. While we will miss her, we find joy in this. Right? It's unreal. You know, this is the peace that surpasses understanding. It doesn't make sense. Why, why would we be, feel, feel joyful at her departing? Well, we know that she's face to face with him. Sin is done in her life. She never has a struggle or warfare ever again. Just the imperishable, the experience of the glory that, and the reward that she stored up during her life in loving people and sharing the gospel and the way she treated her children and the way she operated in her marriage. What a model. I don't know the exact number of years they were married or, or have been married or still married. It's probably 60 years or more. Probably more. My question for you today is, have you armed yourself with this way of thinking of Jesus Christ today? It's, it's easy to you know, say yes. No, I believe I, I, can, I can remember when this time before I knew him. And I can remember this now, but sometimes we haven't yet picked up the weapon that we've been given. Sometimes we're still operating in this, <clears throat> you know, in the year of our Lord, the AD of our lives. We're still operating in that. And we just, the weapon's sitting right there. We just haven't picked it up yet. Well, Peter's saying, pick up the weapon. Pick up the weapon. Arm yourselves with this way of thinking. Where right now in your life must you arm yourself with this way of thinking so you can convert a trial to joy? And you say, Lord, thank you for that trial. I know you're equipping me for something. I know you are. Thank you. It's hard. It's so hard. But I know there's something else, and I know that the deeper the suffering, the greater the triumph. As it's stated in James, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various tri trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And your steadfastness, when it has, let, let your steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Indeed, there is nothing we need other than this increasing steadfastness equipped to us by the trials that Jesus Christ and our Lord, our Father, gives us so that we may have this steadfastness. Why? Well, because we have work to do. Before we get there, Peter does, <clears throat> does, does a grounding, an anchoring of this B.C. life, this before Christ life, this before called life. In the next verse, in verse 3, he says, he continues, and he gives us this vivid description of no doubt who we all are or what, who we were before called. He says this, from the to, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. It sounds like Bourbon Street. I mean, that's really what Mardi Gras... Mardi Gras is all of that, right? Somehow it's connected to, you know, I don't know. Like, that's Mardi Gras, right? That's, if you see the thing, you've been to it, I've been to it, never want to go again. It's, it is all of that. Uh, but personally, I, could, I was reading this, and I was like, you know what? That's about 10 years of my rugby career, too. Um, that was, the, that was the moment, you know, you play rugby, you go to the rugby party. Rugby always has a party after. Well, like, that's it. It was, it was you know, uh, I can think back on it. The time between me saying, I'm done, God, and me getting the word of God poured into me uh, with God using my wife, Susanna, as an instrument to say, hey, come here, start listening to the word of God, and things started changing. I went for a long time without hearing the word of God because I was, and I was in, inside of that, what was my action? Well, it's unrestrained, do whatever, whatever is good, whatever I want to do. A whole culture of, um, if you think of living in sensuality, what that means is unbridled, unrestrained flesh. Your flesh is just driving you. I do whatever I want. Right? We, see these, 
we, we see these people. We also see this, we see it, we can remember a time when that was us. Whether it was on the surface or not, it was there. Passions, sexual immorality, drunkenness, excessive, which is, if you were to <clears throat> look at the words, it would mean excessive use of alcohol that leads to drunkenness. Well, I mean, this is, this is directly contrary to this idea of be sober. <laughs> Keep a sober minded and prepared for action as, as Peter has already instructed us. Uh, <clears throat> he says orgies. Orgies would refer to like this excessive feasting. These, uh, they would have these pagan festivals that would have been commonplace in that time where they would worship the whatever, god of fertility, and then they just gorge themselves with food and wine and all of these different kinds of things and, you know, worshiping this pagan god. <clears throat> Drinking parties, and the de- definition that was, uh, that was given from some extra-biblical literature definitely sounded like Mardi Gras and some rugby parties that I experienced, which would refer to events as, quote, a band of drunken, wildly acting people staggering and swaggering through the public streets wrecking havoc. I'm like, yes, that was, that's Mardi Gras, but I, there's a couple of rugby teams I was, a, a couple of rugby parties I was a part of too. Um, and lawless idolatry. Complete disregard for God's first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, like, it's worth considering, like, okay, cool, I can think of that time, and I can look at it and go, well, that's terrible. I was horrible. That was terrible. We, we all can think of that time in our life. Like I said, whether it was on the surface or underneath the hood, under, under the surface, it was there. Perhaps it's, at some level, it's, and here's the, here's, the, here's the catch, at some level, it's all still there. We can't get away from this. But the point here is, you've done, he says, you know, this pastime suffices. In other words, hey, hey, brother and sister, you've done plenty sinning. Now turn and create more distance between what that was and where you're going and where you're pulled to. Create distance between that old way of operating and a new way of operating. Distance between your current state of called and the past. But at the same time, guess what? Even that time in the past serves us. I don't sit here and go, you know, beat myself with shame and guilt. No, why? Bought and paid for. Jesus did the work. He paid the check. Praise God. All paid for, once and for all. However, I can think of that time, and that's what Peter's doing here. He's pointing all those people back to you. Remember when you did this? Yes. The response to that should be two things. One is to anchor the pain that we experienced in that rebellion. I can go back and think about the parties and things and all that, but if I, what if I go back and I think about the results in my life at the time? Absolute agony and pain. It's easy to go back and think of the party, but you're forgetting the hangover the next day. It's easy to go back and think of the drunken, uh, you know, the drinking party and forget the bad decisions you made that impacted your life for the next two years, for example, right? It's, it, that's what he's saying. He's like, go back and remember those things so you can remember the pain of you being rebellious. At the same time, I have you consider the gratitude of being able to say, God, you say, thank you for pulling me out of that because I'm no longer in that, like that. And being able to be grateful for, I am not there today. I'm not there anymore. I don't have those, I, I'm not experiencing that thing anymore. And yet you still got to ask, where in your life are you being pulled back towards those behaviors? Because it has a gravitational pull. We're always going to have this gravitational pull between the old way and the new way. That's the war of sin in our flesh. It's unfortunate. feels that way, but actually it's working to our advantage. It's teaching us this polarity. When I think back of the, of the kid I was rejecting God at my mom's death, I can remember what, I, I know what it is to have no faith or a false faith, right? And whenever I experience somebody that has that, I can go, I see, I, I know exactly where you're at. 
I was there too. We know somebody like this. I was there too. We talked about your story of being called as one of the subsequent glories for Jesus Christ. <laughs> your transition from the B.C. to the A.D. is a subsequent glory. It is a glory of Jesus Christ. And who are you not to use your story to share with others? Who are you not to share your story? Who are you not to share that there was a point where you put your hand up and you were grabbed out of the water just like Peter was when he said three words, Lord, save me. But we have to, what, be alert and sober-minded. And so we have to know that, like, where is this year? I can think of these things. I, you know, I used to be on Bourbon Street. I'm not on Bourbon Street anymore. But are you? You may not think you are. But where, is the flu where right now is the flesh ruling you? Perhaps you aren't cheating on your spouse or indulging in sexual, immo sexual immorality, but where do you have lust in your eyes? Where are you lustfully looking on someone or something? Perhaps you aren't getting drunk with the rugby team, but you're having an extra drink, that extra drink, so you don't feel something or you don't want to deal with it. Perhaps you're not in a wild, excessive feast. But perhaps there's times, if we consider we got a holiday tomorrow, there's holidays where we indulge in excessive feasts, often to the distraction of the actual point. And perhaps we aren't in wild drinking parties of the past, but when we just go to meet friends for drinks, it creates havoc. I'll share a story. I, there's a man that I, I train and coach. Uh, he experienced this this week. He's like, Coach, uh, I feel like I'm dying right now. I said, what happened? He said, well, man, I haven't, you know, I, and he, he's become a Christian last fall. Praise God. He kind of fell back into his BC ways on Thursday. Friday morning, he had a tough lesson, which was, a hangover, some bad decisions, cigar breath, all these things, all the things he used to do. And he had this, when he, went, when he revisited that world, he's like, he realized how far he'd come. I was like, well, you maybe have a headache right now, but did you learn the lesson? Yes. Okay. Praise God. And finally, you know, this lawless idolatry. I mean, maybe we're not worshiping at the idol of money, as much anymore, or the market, or whatever it might be, or our spouse, or our job, or our career, or our identity, or whatever. Maybe we're not worshiping at those things as overtly as we used to be, but perhaps it's still there. It's subtle instead of blatant. So we're called, hey, that's done in the past. Don't continue to do it. How do you prepare to wield this weapon of thinking differently, though? That's, that's where we're going to get into eight tips and four practice areas that Peter laid out for us. But the, high frame, the, the largest frame of this is to wield this weapon. It's two things. Start living more like someone who is running from sin and fleeing sin in obedience. Turn from him and he will flee from you, too. I guess what? You can fight the enemy pretty easily. Turn from him. Start living like someone who is, who is pursuing obedience and stop living like someone who is living for sin, rebellion. It's really the two frames of this, obedience or rebellion. Um, how can we put this into practice? And yes, it takes practice. So here's eight tips for putting the weapon of thinking, the way, thinking of this way of thinking, putting it into practice. All of it's been given to, given to us by Peter this, in this letter. We can almost, and as I was going through this, you can almost imagine Peter, again, who was a man of action, right? Always the guy jumping out of the boat, going, let's go, let's do this, let's, uh. <laughs> I always think of that one where, uh, you know, he's up there, Jesus has brought him up on the mountain, Jesus is transfigured, his glory is revealed, Moses is there, Elijah is there, and what's his, uh, Jesus, can I, I'm going to build some tents. Like, <laughs> come on, man. Hey, be cool. 
He's probably like, <laughs> Peter, calm down. He was a man of action, but not always obedience or soberness of mindedness. Considering his mistakes that he had made, I almost imagine him thinking of his mistakes and writing to these believers in these churches and saying, hey, man, don't make the same mistakes I did. Here's, the tip. here's my tips. Here's, my, here's what I've learned from making the wrong decision. Earlier in the, in the chapter, he said the following, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Three points. Number one, prepare for obedience. Um, Suzanne and I worked with, uh, with some coaches a while back, and one of the, one of the lessons that we were given says, plan your surrender. Plan your surrender. You've got to plan to be obedient. It's harder to be obedient in the moment. It'd be easier if all of us right here in this room and those that listen just say, right now, the next time I'm called to be obedient, it's not going to be a decision. I'm just going to do it. You could make the decision now, today, to be obedient to the thing that's going to come. So who's in for that? Only two, one, two, three, four. I expect every hand to go up, guys. Come on. Seriously? I want all hands up. Okay. Yes, thank you. What you're saying right now is you're making a commitment that the next time the Holy Spirit pushes you to something, it's not going to be a decision. You're not going to, you're just going to go. You just said, you just made the commitment to be obedient, at least on that next rep. Number two, prepare, be, be ready to act, right? Be ready to act. Not later, now. Not I'm going to call the person later, I'm going to call them now. Not forgive them when I feel like it or when I get my mind right. I'm going to forgive them now. And if I have to fall to my knees and ask Jesus to help me do it, then that's what I'm going to do. Stay sober-minded. Number three, stay sober-minded. What does that mean? Stop distracting yourself with stuff. One of the worst things you can do, this is practical and tactical, one of the worst things you can do, when you wake up in the morning, God gives us all a clean slate. What you choose to put into your mind and psyche and heart and soul in that next moment is critical. You can set the, you can set the direction of your day. Now, it doesn't mean you can't course correct later if you mess this up, but you set the direction of your day when you pick up the oxygen tank of the ward when you first wake up and... <sighs> Take, put this oxygen mask on. It's making a declaration to yourself, to him, to everything that comes on out the rest of the day. It'll set the frame for your day, but it'll set you to be sober-minded. Now, if you mess up, like we all will and do, not an excuse, but it happens, and you look at Instagram first, and you get all kinds of who knows what triggering your mind, Stop, course correct, pick up the word, open it, take a deep breath of oxygen and the Holy Spirit, and then get on with your day. But it'll set you to be sober-minded. That's part one, two, and three. Prepare for obedience, be ready to act, stay sober-minded. Number four, he gives us uh, four more here. In 1 Peter 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, So put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Okay, what does that mean? Stop, do, stop, your, stop your fleshly will to do evil. That's malice. It says put away all malice. Stop your fleshly will to do evil and exchange it for doing what is good, like Christ. That's number four. Number five, it says put away all deceit. What does that mean? Stop hiding. Stop keeping secrets. Stop telling lies. Start stepping into the light even when it's uncomfortable. Be willing to drag your secrets and your lies out into the light. Cut the heads off the demons. Cut the heads off the serpents with the truth. Put away all hypocrisy. 
What does that mean? Stop being out of integrity with your word. God is always in integrity with his word. What he says is, let there be light. There was light. Start doing what you say you'll do. Start doing what you said you're going to do. Simple but not easy. But it feels amazing when you feel the integrity of closing the loop on what you said you were going to do. Because when you say what you're going to do, especially if it's driven by the Holy Spirit and you can see this, Holy Spirit said, say this thing to this person and you do it, even if it maybe was uncomfortable, you, feel, you can feel this joy of just, even if you're suffering around it, this joy of being integrity with, with the Word. Stop, in, stop envying things of the world. I know the, uh, the ladies have been doing a, a Bible study on this. <clears throat> it says, put away all envy. There's nothing in this world that you should envy. In- instead, exchange your envy for worship. And finally, he says, put away all slander. Stop making false accusations. And start bringing consistent words of encouragement. Now, those false accusations can take a lot of forms. One might be some opinion, right? Uh, sometimes the false accusations are accusations we're putting on ourselves, lies that we're telling ourselves. <clears throat> Instead, bring encouragement to those around us and to yourself. Even David encouraged himself. He went by going to the Word, by going to God. That's how he found encouragement. Even David in a pit showed us how to do that. So those are the, those are the kind of eight tips. Prepare for obedience. Be ready to act. Stay sober-minded. Stop, start doing good. Stop hiding. Tell the truth. Be in integrity. Stop envying things. Stop making false accusations and instead bring encouragement. But where can we practice this? Unfortunately, God and Peter laid out the practice field. It takes practice to do these things. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we need practice. And as Aletha so incredibly put it, and I think that we need to put this somewhere, small reps prepare you for big reps. Small reps prepare you for big reps. And practice, so step number one in the practice field, practice small reps before you get to the big reps. <laughs> Start practicing before the big rep comes. And we're given... Uh, and Peter laid this out in chapters um, 2 and 3, we're given domains with which to practice these things. Specifically, in practicing submission to authority. Uh, in chapter 2, he talked about submission to the government leaders. He said, be subject to, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether the, emperor, whether the emperor is supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who are evil or praise those who do good. It doesn't matter. He says, you're in it. Submit to the government. Submit to whatever structure I've put you in. You're salt and light. You're in it, not of it. That's it. It's a little rep. I don't like what the, I don't like what this is, but I understand I'm not, he's not, like the emperor's not, not my king, but I'll be in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the framework because that's where God's put me right now. And I can have faith that he, he's in control of the whole thing. President Biden right now is because God wanted him to be there. That's it. Same thing for the previous president, same thing for the next one. And all the world leaders, right? They're there because God decided that. Don't like it? Do like it? Doesn't matter. I can still submit to that and say, I don't like this, but I'm going to submit to what this is, as long as it's not counter to God's will, God's will and God's word. Number two, he said, leaders. He said, he said uh, servants. Be subject to your masters in all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures suffering while sorrows while suffering unjustly. So we may be in a workplace. We may be in some type of other construct or that is not a, it doesn't feel good to us, um, but I'm going to submit to it anyway and recognize, again, I'm not in it, but not of it. It gives me little reps. Then we get to marriage. Wives, it says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even though some do this, even, even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Again, it's not always 
It's definitely not going to feel good to say, well, I'm submitting to the will of my husband and the leadership of my husband. You can rebel against that, or you can be obedient to the word. Aletha gave a great example <laughs> about some plants. Here's all these plants. I could get them. She asked Mike. Mike said, no, let's wait do this other thing. She wanted to do it. Did it anyway. Small route, but incredible route because she shared the story with us. And I think about that all the time. Husbands, you got to submit to the word of God because he gives us a command right there. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of, grace of, of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, and all of us, I mean, by the way, these are, <laughs> these are all to all of us. Like, who are you not to submit to what this says do? It's little reps. These little reps prepare us for the big reps. What would the big rep look like? The big, big rep would look like somebody saying, denounce Jesus or I'm going to put a billet in your head. Are we ready for that? You will be if you've done the reps. You call on him. But at the minimum, most of us are not going to face that. Let's just face it, not in our country, not in our lives. We don't know a lot of martyrs. But at the minimum, we will face what he talks about next. At the minimum, maligning and ridicule and attack and attacks that will come to every single one of us. It will come to us. It will come from the world. He says in the next verse, verse 4, with respect to this, they, meaning the Gentiles, those in the, in the B.C. world, uh, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they, what? They malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. As I was preparing this lesson and I was thinking about those days in rugby, I had a, had a roommate. His name was Mike. Um, he was on my rugby team. We were like best buddies. And we definitely for years, participated in the, you know, what, <laughs> the way this is put, uh, a band of wildly drunk, drunken, wildly acting people swaggering and staggering through the streets wrecking havoc. I, he and I were in that band together for years. And then about five years into knowing each other, all of a sudden something started changing with him. He started going to church, started having Bible study in our kitchen, started not going out with us, started not reacting to the same things we did. And what was my reaction and the reaction of many of my teammates, most of my teammates, to malign him? I recognized that this morning. I recognized that he was holding up a mirror to all of us. We made fun of him. Like, oh, look at Mike and Jesus. He's going to go play rugby with Jesus. That's what we used to say. How blasphemous. We were maligning him. Why? Why? Because he was holding up a mirror of obedience to the hearts of a bunch of rebellious young men. Like we talked about a few weeks ago, when, when the armor of that suffering that he was starting to put on started to come on and the shininess of it started to happen, our reaction was to throw rocks and mud at it. We don't want to see it. I don't want to hang out with him anymore. And as that promise is here, it says they will malign you when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery. You will be maligned because you're holding up a mirror of obedience. The obedient actions of the called hold up a mirror to the rebellious. So how should we act when the stones and mud are thrown at us? Well, as I think about my brother Mike, uh, this is how he acted. It was in the verse of Peter uh, chapter 3. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Mike never came back at us for making fun of him, even though he used to be just like us. Now all of a sudden he's like this, and we're like, dude, you're... Right? He never came back at us. I didn't realize that until this morning. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, and we were 100% slandering him, 
those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And here he is putting me to shame 12 years later, 15 years later, this morning. For it is better to suffer by do, for doing good than it is than it should be God's will. For it is better to suffer for doing good if it should be God's will than doing evil. So my action on this this morning and my push and action was I reached out to Mike this morning at like 4 a.m. I said, hey, man, we haven't talked in two years. I recognize this happened. I took a picture of this. I said, this happened. I said, I see you for what was happening back then. I need, I, I'm asking for your forgiveness. Because 100%, I was the one uh, getting the, you know, we'll have to give account. I was like, I got to give account. <laughs> I got to give, give account for that. The first step is I got to ask for forgiveness for the one that I wronged. Not only Jesus, but my brother Mike. I haven't talked to Mike in years, but Holy Spirit said go, so I went. Here was my question, though. Where in your life have you been the maligner? Where in your life have you been the maligner of the person that's being obedient? And perhaps where right now are you being the maligner? Who must you ask for forgiveness for being a maligner to their obedience? Is there somebody that comes to your mind or heart? I'd encourage you, if it does, that you would do yourself well to seek forgiveness <clears throat> because you will have to give account. And if you can go and use this as an opportunity for, to deploy forgiveness for them or ask for forgiveness from them, uh, it's an opportunity for you to exercise this weapon. And finally, the last, uh, the last verse here, he says, <clears throat> and this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The important part here is the dead that he's referring to are those that heard the gospel, died in the flesh. He's saying they're still alive in the spirit. Uh, there was an idea that perhaps there was people that died, that if they died before Jesus came back, that they are lost. And he's saying, no, 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 no. They heard the gospel. They're gone. They're, <clears throat> they're alive in the spirit the way God is. And in this point, uh, what this brings up is this idea of <clears throat> once you're called into the year of your Lord, into your AD, into this after point, this, this point that is after Jesus has uh, called you, um, you're always called. The point is this. There's no such thing as this idea as I used to be a Christian. There's no used to be a Christian. We don't have the power for that. You either were one of a few things. You were either a person that's not yet called, that's in total rebellion, you're either the person that is uh, not called and is, or is uh, a person that is not called and is staying in rebellion, a person that is not yet called and is in rebellion, or someone who is called and is in rebellion. But I point to this in John 10. He says, I already told you, Jesus, the words of Jesus, but you do not believe. The works of it I do in my Father's name testify on my behalf. But, but because you are not my sheep, you, refer, you refuse to believe. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If you are his and you hear his voice, you cannot not follow him. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that a beautiful line? It can never be taken away. Regardless of what your story may be. Oh, I'm no longer a Christian. Like, if you're in his hand, you're not being taken out. Although, if you're in his hand, you're probably not saying that. But who are we to know? We don't know that. That's not for our call. That's not our call. That's a mystery of God. He says, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and the Father and I are one. So what is our, the, our response, though? As someone that is following him, what is our response to that? What is our response to someone who is either where we used to be, someone who is in rebellion, someone who is... Uh, 
you know, maybe in a, in a pit that's under attack right now. They're called, but they're so covered under attack that it feels like they're just rebellious and isolated. What is our response? Like, what are we equipped to do? We'll go back to what he said. He said, arm your way with this way of thinking. Arm yourself. Why? So we can go to war. We get to go to war for these people. What are our tactics? Keep broadcasting the word of God. Just that's it. Keep broadcasting the word of God so that the sheep may hear his voice. Not your voice, his voice. Keep sharing the word of God. Study the word of God. Breathe in the word of God so you're ready. Whenever the word of God is called forth, you've got it. Don't worry about what you'll say. The Holy Spirit will give you the right words at the right time. But when you're pushed, go. Number two, keep the way of Christ thinking. What does this look like? What does this look like for the person that's in our life that is saying, you know, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not. Or I don't believe in that anymore. Or I could never believe. Is this. Absolute, unyielding, spirit-driven patience. The same patience that was given to us. And when they attack, we do not attack back. When they, when they attack and they revile us or revile you, you forgive them. And you remember and draw from the mercy that you were given and have mercy for them. Love them anyway, no matter what. It might be the rebellious spouse. It might be the rebellious child. It might be the rebellious coworker. It might be the rebellious relative. It might be the rel- whatever that is. Rebellious to you, rebellious to God, just keep loving them and never give up. He didn't give up on that hill. He didn't give up on that cross. So who are we not to mirror that? And remember that you get to, you get to have that experience. It can feel frustrating. Why, isn't, why can't this person get there? Well, we're getting that experience of having the patience. If they just got there immediately, we wouldn't get the gift of what is it like to have patience. It's a long game. Because the truth is two things. One is... We should fear not. Who is there to harm you for being zealous for what is good? We should be passionate about these opportunities. And the truth is that, you, that we, however, do not and will never know who is or isn't called by God. So our, our job is simply to follow his commandments and do what? He says, if, if, you will follow my, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. And use the life that he's given us in this AD phase of our life to do what? Let's follow what Peter did. Feed my sheep. Peter knew all about this. Because even if we have denied Christ for 10 years, 20 years, 70 years, whatever it is, we do not know. A person can can have denied Christ their entire life. We don't know what happens in the final seconds. We don't know what Jesus does. It's not our business. We don't know. It's It's not important. What is important is that we're given a directive that we get to do. And and, uh, Peter knew all about this intimately because after denying Jesus three times, after disobeying him and being at the lake instead of the mountain and bringing a whole bunch of people with him, still being disobedient, Jesus had the following words for them. He said, and this is John 21, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. And then the third time, and what had to have been painful, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? It had to be excruciating for Peter in that moment. And he said, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. That's what we're called to do. If you've been given the gift, be like Peter. Use the weapon. Feed the sheep. 
whoever that person or those people are in your life. We've been given an instruction book, booklet. Breathe this in every day so we can bring that to those sheep and feed those that are hungry. So it is with, so it was with Peter, so it is with us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this, uh, this time. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for your word. We ask that it um, carries us through the week, that we understand how to wield the weapon of your way of thinking. Let your way be our ways. Let us exchange our ways for only your way. Help us with this as we struggle and fight. But with all that, move us further and further away from what we used to be. Let us find a heart of gratitude for the journey you've put us on. And give us a heart of unyielding patience and mercy and kindness and gentleness for those sheep that you put in our path. We thank you for all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. For that word. Um, we're going to take part in the Lord's Supper here shortly, as we do every week. Um, and I was praying during uh, the message. Um, I've, I've come to a place where I don't really try to prepare anything for this time. Um, I did early on. I kind of stopped doing that because uh, the spirit moves during the message always gives me something to talk about leading into this to relate to it. Um, and I don't know that I 100% clearly see the connection right now, um, but I just keep getting hit with unity, 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 unity. Um, there's some threads. Spirit's got his connection. I don't fully see it necessarily, but I'm going to be obedient and, and follow through with that. Um, so Jesus prayed uh, that we together as believers would be one um, as he and the Father are one. That's a mind-blowing concept um, that I don't think we'll ever fully grasp until we're on the other side of glory, uh, possibly, maybe not even then. Uh, we, we won't know until we're there. <clears throat> but... Uh, this, this is a symbol of unity. Um, this is a symbol, a sacrament given to us from Jesus that is more than just symbolic. Uh, there's means of grace, there's mysteries to it, there's all that, but it's, it is a symbol of unity as well. Um, so I just, I can't help but wonder and question. Uh, we're called to be one, and that's the worldwide church as well, uh, but that's also the, the local expressions of the church like trinity as we are here um and it just we we had a difficult evening last night with some very dear friends <laughs> and it weighed heavy on me through the night and i'm carrying it today um sorry didn't see that coming <clears throat> and aletha saw some things very clearly uh, as we were spending time with these friends talking uh, and she called it out, and um, it, it's a friend who says he was a believer and no longer is. Um, and as you talk to him, it's, you know, it, there's barriers, there's walls, there's fortresses that he's building up, and you can attack those, you can engage with them, um, but if you knock one down, there's just another one. Um, and it really just comes down to you, you, you as a person, you can't do anything. You can pray for them. But engaging, winning an argument, fighting over this or that, it's not going to change anything. Only God can do that. Mm. Um, only God can leap over all those fortresses and barriers and get straight to the person. Um, and I see a parallel in the church where there is a reluctance to all these commands of one another's, be one, be united. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm right there. It, it's not easy. 
it's difficult, it's complicated, it's frustrating, painful, whatever those different things may be. Um, but I question myself and all of you together, um, those of us that are here and not here, what barriers are you putting up? What fortresses, walls are you building on your own to block yourself from the unity that we're called to be? There are supernatural, miraculous things that occur in the Christian life, in our world, that we watch God do, that we witness at times, but it's not the normative Christian walk. Uh, the normative walk, which the Bible shows us very clearly if we're willing to see it, is that God works through other people. Um, he works in our lives through each other, mostly, through his word and through one another, to strengthen, to edify, to build up, to sharpen, um, that is how we get more unified. Um, and, and how that happens in the local church is through this, gathering together on Sundays, worshiping, taking part in the Lord's Supper together. Um, it happens on Wednesday evenings in this body when we come together, when we eat, when we pray, when we spend time together. It happens on Monday evenings with the women. It happens on times where men gather um, whatever that may be at different times. It happens over coffee. It happens over lunch. One-on-one -on -one is, is believers together. So my question to all of us is, what are we putting up in front of that and saying, I'm not going to do that for this reason or that reason or whatever it may be? Um, How is the Spirit speaking to you now sitting here um, among the people that we are called to at least in this season for a time, whether it be months, years, decades, whatever we have together as a body, what's the Spirit calling you to do? To engage in that, to use your gifting, to help the body function the way the body's supposed to be. Because we all have a part, we all have a special gift. The Spirit gives us all gifts to build one another up, to equip each other, to edify each other, and ultimately to glorify Him is the, the real ultimate purpose to all of it. Um, but search and question and, and find out what those are for you um, and, and ask God to tear it down because you probably can't tear it down on your own anyway. You need the Spirit to do that. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we'll move into uh, the Lord's Supper now. Um, we'll take time to search ourselves, ask the Spirit to search us, show us where we are not in line with him and with one another uh, and take time to deal with that so we can approach the table uh, rightly together. Um, and I will also pray the Lord's Prayer um, as I normally do. I want to just address a, an awkward thing that's been going on that's on me for not addressing it. Um, the little tag on at the end of the Lord's Prayer. I don't do it. I think it's been very obvious. Um, the reason I don't do it is it's not in the original, man the earliest manuscripts. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, it's not part of the words Jesus gave us to pray. Nothing wrong with doing it, nothing wrong with praying that way to pray that way. Um, for those reasons, I'm not going to do it up here. Um, so if we can unify in that understanding, I think it'll take away what probably has caused some awkward, confusing moments at times, and I should have addressed it sooner, so I apologize for that. But just so you know, going into it, uh, when we get to the end of lead us not into, into temptation, deliver us from evil, amen. And we'll, we'll pick it up from there. Uh, so take some time, uh, let the spirit work on you, and we'll come back and take the elements.
Dear Father, we thank you for all of who you are in your holiness, in your righteousness, in your loving kindness, in your justice, in your long suffering, all the multitude of characteristics that make up who you are, uh, many of which we probably cannot even begin to grasp and understand. Uh, we thank you for the work you have done and the work you continue to do. I uh, thank you for every soul that is in this room and that is a, a part of Trinity Church Oak Cliff uh, that may not be here with us today. I uh, thank you for bringing us together for working in and through us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to reveal to us more and more what unity of your body is, um, what one spirit, one faith, one body really means, and how we fulfill that to look more and more like Jesus. I pray that you would knit us together more tightly, uh, that you would use us to grow one another, to edify each other, to encourage each other, to strengthen and sharpen one another, and that we would be able to grow up into your spirit more. Uh, Father, please uh, help us to meditate on you and what the coming of Jesus, his death, his resurrection means completely. Um, the work on the cross he did for us, the work the Spirit does in us now sanctifying, uh, and the work that will come when we are one day glorified. And Father, we pray the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, um, as Paul writes, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. See nothing but the blood, uh, page 252. First, third, and fourth. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Please uh, join me in a closing prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this time that you have spent with us and the word that went forth, the worship that we collectively gave to you. Lord, may it be a sweet smelling aroma in you. Uh, in, your, in your nose, Lord, and a sweet sound in your ears. Lord, um, thank you for, the, for the, our, our, our testimonies, Lord, uh, that, that uh, remind us of the great things you've done in our lives, Lord, and the message that went forth, Lord. And that is something that we will bear uh, as, as, as a strong testimony to you, Lord, for, and the gospel. Lord, uh, be with us this week as we go forth to work and to, to be, with our, be with our families. And if we travel, Lord, we pray for traveling graces. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.